Uh, great. So feel free to stop me at any point along the way. I'm going to kind of try and cover parts of the, the program, and then we can go in deeper in some stuff that, that I may not have slides on. But so, um, uh, um, so, um, so let me start with where we're kind of starting as a program and thinking about the um, so <laughs> what's happening in our program is we're getting a lot of s students who are we're getting fresh uh, kind of uh, CS undergrads, but also a lot of people who had had training as uh, in some technical field. Maybe it was computer science, maybe it was something else. In, in, uh, um, so even in 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 some form of medical. Uh, um, area that was maybe 10 or more years ago. And so the, the, they came with a certain training of, this is often the, uh, um, so the, um, um, so the classic scientific paradigm where the idea is you, you make some hypothesis. I'm sure you all learned this even in high school. You go and then gather data um, and make some observations. You compute statistics on the data you've gathered. Um, and then you try and draw some conclusions based on these statistics. And it's actually very important that you, based on how what we know about statistics, that you do it in this way that the statistics are only on this data and not earlier data, otherwise certain assumptions break down. Um, but you know, sometimes you make some scientific um, understanding this way, sometimes you realize your hypothesis is wrong and you go and do this over and over again, and you make a new hypothesis. Um, and so but what's happened um, over the last um, um, so over, over the last few decades is that we've been able to gather very easily enormous amounts of data kind of independent of, of some hypothesis that, um, um, that we possibly had about the data. Some examples are in, in astronomy, the big one was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They just took pictures of the sky and certain, um, <laughs> certain stars without kind of saying, we're going to study this one you know, by itself. And in um, um, some more on the biology side is people looked at um, <laughs> when they sequenced the whole human genome. Right? There were things they wanted to know, but having this whole data set was important by itself. It allowed for news forms of discovery. So now we have this enormous data set. And so now often the first phase of it is how do you deal with the scale? How do you get it down to some working data? Um, then once you have working data, you do this data mining on top of it, where what you're looking to do is to try and find patterns in the data that satisfy certain statistical properties at the same time. And so this is a bit different than how we had done statistics before, and there's still some stuff that's kind of not understood of what's the right way to do this. Um, and, and then at the same goal then is to draw some scientific conclusion. Maybe it's to write a paper, or maybe it's to actually treat patients better in, in, in some way. But the end goal is the same. Um, th that part looks the same, but the process has changed a lot. Okay, and so computer science has played a really important role in this new pipeline. Part of it is dealing with the large amounts of data, um, and part of it is this areas of data mining and machine learning falls in here, where we're developing these new techniques based on starting with the data and looking for patterns instead of calculating a fixed set of statistics that maybe we could do by hand. Um, but now these are like these are things you don't want to do by hand. Okay, and in this is, now it's important and we don't quite understand it, precisely how to do this, but we have some good ideas of how to model and certainly bound the air in this process. And they're slightly different than before. Okay, so, so this is kind of the pipeline that's a fairly new pipeline of how a lot of science is happening now. And there are some key s skills that we try and teach in our uh, this uh, <laughs> big data certificate program and this graduate courses we have in the, mainly graduate courses in the computer science department. Um, okay, so if you, a common way that people look at these tools are these, these kind of, um, these, these just off-the-shelf tools. And so a lot of interaction people have with them are through things like this. To deal with the enormous data, you have something like Hadoop or Spark is, this, is one of these new versions of kind of uh, generations of this coming out. There's some sort of data munging where you have data, you're, you're trying to work with this data. Um, 
you know, maybe it's an Excel spreadsheet, maybe something more advanced than that after you've pulled out the relevant stuff with the dupe or something else. Uh, maybe you can combine these together. Then you have some toolboxes where you're using some machine learning algorithms or some data mining techniques built into R, or Scikit, and Python. And then you kind of output some illustrations and plots and discuss them and put them in your papers or discuss with uh, some colleagues you're working with. Um, and so the way we view these is there are actually new fundamental parts out of the computer science program which are actually building the foundations of all these techniques. Okay, so there's this idea of these databases that made these no, these no SQL databases. So um, if you had taken a database class 10 years ago, it almost assuredly would have been um, one based on how to use SQL, where you have very structured, rigid data, well formatted. Most modern data is not like this. It has every, there's missing elements, there's lots of different types that are all put together. Um, so, you, so these SQL t form of, of, of databases um, aren't always the best tool for this. There's dealing with this data at scale and understanding kind of the implications of doing this, working with it, and, and pulling out parts maybe in a somewhat ad hoc way about how to do this very efficiently. Um, this a lot of modern algorithms deals with how to do this very, very efficiently and at scale and understand the trade-offs here. And then in using these toolboxes, you know, you could plug these in the way you would just understanding like a, like a, a T statistic or something in statistics, but you probably took a statistics class before you use these uh, sorts of statistics. There are these tools which are more complicated. They're more sensitive to how you're interacting with the data. There are easier ways to kind of screw up along the way. The same way that if you use statistics incorrectly, you're going to end up you know, you could fool yourself or you could, or you could actually cheat a little bit in how you're, uh, um, in how you're presenting the data. Sometimes when you're dealing with data mining machine learning, you're doing this and maybe you're not even, you're fooling yourself as well because you did something that seemed logical and it output a result that looked good, but you want to understand what you're actually doing underneath to make sure it's, it's, it's accurate. And so there are classes and understand the foundations of what's going on here. Um, and then these illustrations and plots you often do at the end. Um, in, when dealing with data and complex data, just doing a, a pie chart or a line chart is often not enough to really capture what's going on. And so there's this field of, of, <laughs> of visualization and how it interacts with statistics. We often call this um, information visualization. And this is a field in and of itself. And, and kind of they, these things kind of blend across each other. It's not, you know, in the, in the academic research side of things, these are very blended, but our view of them, we have classes in each of these areas, All right? Um, and so, okay, so when you think of this data science, it's really at the intersection of all these things, right? If you're understanding how to work with this complex data and understanding the aspects and how when you do different, as um, different parts of this process, how they're affecting the end result, this requires understanding lots of these tools and how these all fit together. Right, um, okay, and so, so what we call, or I call someone who's mastered all these areas, this is what I would call a, um, so this is what I would call, this is what I would call a data scientist. So if you've heard this term, this is my view, someone who kind of understands how all this fits together in dealing with this complex data, this new <laughs> data science pipeline. Okay, so let's see, so, so how is our view, how is this taught in our program? Um, so we have these fundamentals in, the, in a database class. We have two versions of this class. We have one that is more about using the SQL still. This is still a very important tool, the, the structured databases. This class is a little bit more accessible to people without a CS background. We also have a class that deals with building this, uh, this um, the back end of these NoSQL databases. That's for very advanced people. If you want to learn about that, you can learn about from you know really an, an expert in the in this field international expert um, and we're kind of been developing classes that are using various of these other systems we don't have classes that okay let's learn how to use 
Uh, um, so like, let's just learn how to, um, let's just learn how to, um, um, so let's just learn how to use MongoDB. We'd rather say, what are the fundamentals? Because some of these systems weren't around a few years ago. Some of them won't be around in, in another few years. We want to understand the fundamentals. Where's the field going? Um, there's a lot of issues with algorithms. I won't go into, into too much here, but they're kind of things when you're, if, if, you're out, if your code is running slow, your process is running slow, you're not sure why it's happening. It's because you haven't, you probably haven't understood the, the trade-offs of the efficiency of the, these algorithms. And so if you take it a class in, this, in the algorithms, it'll kind of open your eyes to what, why do certain things run efficiently and why things, certain things don't. And sm usually small changes in what you're doing can really change the efficiency when you're dealing with lots of data at scale. Okay. Um, um, and so then, so I have pictures for data mining and machine learning. Maybe you know um, about these, but these are, so data mining is more trying to find some, some structure in data, understanding what happens if you process data with, with clustering, if you're dealing with high dimensional data, um, if, you're, if you have noise in your data, how to find some good fit, say some linear regression or polynomial regression fit, but dealing with noise so it doesn't get, um, it's not susceptible to outliers. Some issue is that you could have a lot of outliers in the data, but you may not because there are so many or because the data is so noisy, you don't understand it until you do the data mining. You don't want to be, you can't always pull them out ahead of time. You want to find a fit that is robust to these outliers and to do this at scale. How do you interact with this? How do you find similar things in a very large data set? Um, what does it mean to find things that are similar? This can help you do classification, can help you kind of find if you've found a similar patient to another patient you have, say if you have some rare disease, how do you find if these two are similar to each other? How would you formulate, um, how would you formulate this process? Then machine learning is more, um, the way we, these two topics are very intertwined. At Utah, we teach them, we've essentially arbitrarily split them, where machine learning is much more focused on, you have a bunch of data that you understand the outcome of, so you have a bunch of patients, some of them have cancer, some of them don't have cancer. You have a new patient, you want to predict, is this person going to have cancer? It's about having new unlabeled data and you're trying to predict what the label is on this data. And so there's a huge amount of built up around this. And this is probably, among the data mining machine learning, the single most important problem, predicting whether what's going to happen with new data as you're getting it. And so machine learning is, is, a, <laughs> is around this topic. Right. Um, okay, um, and so then visualization, as I mentioned, is about interacting and displaying and, and the kind of the trade-offs you get of dealing with this, <laughs> this sort of complex data and how it ties in with the results of the outputs of the machine learning and the data mining. How do you visualize this in a way where you're not obscuring information? How do you convey as much information as possible? Um, and the people generally teach this class have a lot of ties with people um, in the in the medical center as well, so a lot of their applications are motivated from from um, from problems inside the um, so inside the medical domain as well. Um, okay, um, so so each of these classes are kind of core classes, and if you take all five of these, or you can actually substitute out one for electives, it's a bit more flexible. These five classes count as this graduate certificate in big data. Okay, so this is a program you can take and get this on your, it, it will go on your transcript, is kind of the end, end result of it. Um, and these classes, we've, we, um, I forget if I'll mention this in slides, we, we, we live stream them and we, and we videotape them and they're online, so it's a bit more accessible if your flex, schedules are not as, as, as flexible. Because um, we have lots of different types of students with different backgrounds taking these classes. It's about two-thirds people who have, depending on the class, a CS background, about one-third who don't. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it, they aren't just, just, um, just people with strong CS backgrounds, so don't be too intimidated if, uh, if, if you're coming at this without a pure CS background. 
Um, we have a bunch of other classes on top of these, which are these advanced topics classes that kind of build on these techniques. So if students are taking getting a master's degree with us, they're going to take these core classes, and then they're going to take roughly five more of these other classes that are basically advanced type of machine learning, advanced type of algorithms or databases, or advanced types of <laughs> visualization, and you specialize your degree around this. Um, and there's lots of options. These are changing. We're growing in faculty and hire new people with new expertise in these areas all the time. Um, and then if you're doing research with us in the PhD program if, um, or some of the master's students, then we have applications in, in these lots of different areas. And so the thesis completes by working on these with in various applications, right? So this is the graduate certificate in big data. This is like the, the MS in data management and analysis. So if you're interested in that, it's within, it's an MS in computing, but it's uh, an emphasis in data management analysis. And then you can do a PhD in research and lots of other stuff here. Um, okay, so um, I, I thought I'd just conclude with a few questions, um, kind of um, so some, just give you a taste of some of the challenges we're looking at from, from research perspective. Um, so kind of the, the, this is still a new field and we haven't quite figured out how to do everything in this, in this yet. So some of the big picture challenges which have really um, kind of are driving some of the <laughs> things that we're looking at. Um, so if, you, if you're doing data mining on this big data and you find a pattern, um, so how do we know we're finding patterns which aren't actually there? It looks like there's a nice structure in the data, but maybe it's because we've come up with this great algorithm which can find all these structures and we just have so much data that it looks like something is there. Um, so if you've heard of this like p-hacking in, <laughs> in statistics, this is kind of like doing this on accident, right? So this is the false discovery problem. And this comes up in, in like a lot of scientific journals. We'll publish results that later we'll find out this isn't, isn't really there. How do we do data mining while protecting against this at the same time? Right? So this is kind of a question that drives some of the statistical influence in this, in this work. Um, and how do these interact? This statistics has kind of kept away from a lot of this data mining stuff. They said, oh, this is computer science people. Let's let, let them do their own thing. But now both communities are realizing they need to work together to solve these sorts of problems. Um, so the, <laughs> there's another issue where a lot of this data comes from people, right? A lot of our large data sets that we get in the school of computing are from these, these social media companies. And uh, we can't get the data directly from them, but we can often, say, scrape data from Twitter or Instagram or some of these other places. And now we have data where each user is a person. What are we revealing about the person if we, if we do this search? Is this OK? I'm sure in the, in the medical domain, you, you guys have a lot more restrictions on what you can do, but I'm not convinced those restrictions are always safeguarding everything that's going on. But at the same point, if you, if you don't allow these safeguards, maybe it hinders what you can do. What is the right line to deal with and analyze this big data without violating privacy? And, and how do you do as much as possible without, well, say, anonymizing this data? This is another kind of big picture question driving us. Um, and so then, then finally another thing is we're getting lots and lots of these different, <coughs> different data sources. Um, we're, we're, we're finding new ways to gather them even as, you know, maybe that comes up against the second one where there's a privacy issue, but these data sets are becoming available. And they're not always trustworthy. These can be very noisy data sets, a lot of false data in them, missing data. How do we know which to trust? How do we combine these all together into a single analysis when they have much very different types? And so these are kind of three very high level big picture problems which are driving a lot of research. And our research is going in small threads that run across these problems, but as you you know, over the next five or 10 years, if you're looking at the theme of, of a lot of research in this area, I would say that these three things or variants of them are gonna be driving forward a lot of what's, what's going on. Um, okay, so um, 
Okay. So, um, um, so how much time do you want me to go? Um, do you, how much time do you have left? Do you want to just? I think that'd be a good like. Hmm? I think that has to be a good like discussion stopping. Oh, uh, sure. Okay, great. And, and I just want to mention one more thing. I this a, a new development that's not on the slides yet. We're probably going to start a new program with the math department. Focus more on the statistics side of things, integrating uh, more statistical. Um, modeling classes into a slightly different program. So look for that. There may, may be some version of that starting in the fall, maybe, and then if not, a year from now as well. That hopefully would have a lot of these different stopping points, so the certificate, and the master's degree, and, and so forth coming out down the road. Um, but right. great. Thanks, Seth. Do you have questions? Can we audit the big data certificate courses for free and not for credit? Uh, and if so, do we have to like actually register or can we just go to the videos and watch the videos on the web? Um, so, so all the videos are are posted on YouTube. Um, so they're all freely available. Um, auditing the classes, so it's up to the individual instructor. It's, you know, it's, they're on YouTube. You can, they're, they're being live streamed, in fact, but you get a little bit more if you're in the class. Um, and generally, if the room size is not over, over, over full, then we're fine with that. It's up to the instructor, but I don't know anyone who's, who, who's uh, ever said no at this point. So that means you can just physically show up, but you don't actually have to register as an auditing student? Yeah, so, so as, as long as we don't run to room capacity. A couple years ago, we had some growing issues and we were at room capacity, but I, I don't think that will be an, an, an issue going forward, at least not in the next year or two. But we'll see. Um, let's see if it's, okay, I don't. Um, so if, if you go to, so I email me the stuff and I'll email. sure yeah, yeah yeah I'll do that. So if you if you search for my webpage or the big data and SOC, there's a link to these things. The, the actual YouTube channel is a weird string of characters, but uh, yeah. Bruce, do you have a, a, a interest group or seminar kind of thing, particularly that might be talking about uh, bio data or medical data? Um, so m most of our working groups don't work so much that the, the, the group of faculty who, who work in information visualization, they work much closer to this. And, and I don't know if they have a specialized meeting around that. I know a lot of their examples come from, come from the bio data. Um, if, if you, I, I can try and, if you're interested, I'm happy to, uh, you know, set up interactions with, um, w with those faculty. Yeah, a lot of common interests, I think, between biomedical uh, informatics and like that have a seminar or, or a journal club or whatever. You know, what we should probably do is get like an exchange program. So like the math biology program, <coughs> biomedical informatics is going to have an exchange. We spend, we send a speaker down there once a year, once a semester, and they send a speaker up to us. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that'd, that'd be that interesting. Would, that would work out very well. You know, the three things you have here, I think they're really relevant. So the false discovery, so Mark Gandell mentioned that. The need for bonfaroni corrections. My favorite example of that in kind of healthcare is people image dead salmons, the functional magnetic resonance imaging of dead salmon, and found correlation with human facial expressions that were shown to the dead salmon. <laughs> because you get so many voxels that you do these statistical values and you don't do a bonfaroni correction, you're going to discover something. A HIPAA, HIPAA are like the rules that guide our you know, privacy of release of data. Privacy people say that it's about, you can identify, re-identify about one in 10,000 people from HIPAA compliant data. So one in 10,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but you start getting large collective repositories, you might have millions of patients, you could re-identify hundreds of, of people with that. Mm -hmm. And data that you can trust, you know, medicine doesn't like to trust anything that the physician didn't collect themselves. But now it's going to be a, tons of patient reported data, app, uh, uh, physical monitoring, et cetera, that are all going to be things that, that we're going to start learning how to, to cope with. So all those things, I think, are really very relevant to, to what's going on. Any one or two more questions? Uh, so where would be the starting point for computer experience if you're looking at the certificate? Like, 
you start from like not knowing anything and you'd still be okay, or should you have some foundation? Yeah, so, so, uh, so the three things we look for in students coming to this program. So these are, these are graduate level CS classes, but a CS degree is not required. So about, we're trying to re-figure out the undergrad path to get to these classes as a data science major, and we don't quite know how to do this yet, but it does not require most of CS. So what we believe it requires is a background in, some background probably in statistics, some background in some linear algebra, so not a huge amount, but know the basic terminology, in, at least in both of these areas. And then from a CS side, you need, you need, at, least a class, you, you need at least a class in data structures. So this is not just scripting background, probably will not be enough to take these classes. But we found if you're bright and you, you kind of you can get into another good graduate program and you've had a class in data structures, which is how to store data so you can access it more efficiently than just scanning it over it, it again, and how to manipulate this in various ways. There's a, there's a class at an undergrad level, we teach a class 20, um, called 2420, CS 2420. You can, there are online versions of classes that cover this material. So we've had students who've gone and taken the 2420 class and then jumped into these and have done great. We've had students who've learned some of this on their own and done well as, as well. Um, depending on how much you know coming in, the first couple classes may take a little bit to get you a little bit more work to kind of um, catch up as you're going. Um, but th those are the three basic things that, <laughs> um, that we are, are kind of looking for in interest students. And, and if you email me, usually I get lots of emails about this. I can try and point you to kind of more specific resources, although for the day structures, we kind of are very flexible, so we don't point to you, you have to take this particular class. Um, but I can give you some examples, so. All right, well, thanks for coming on. Great. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Do you use a specific language or are you language agnostic? Uh, so I think most classes are taught in a different language or are language agnostic. So, um, so the class in, in, in visualization, they build up like a specific job. Oh, they use processing, right? It's some, yeah, I, I think it's processing. Um, some classes are just agnostic. The, so it, it depends a lot on the class. Um, okay. But if Python is one great class, well, one great language if you're going to learn one. Great. All right. Thanks.